Good evening. evening. Welcome, everyone. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this evening to worship and praise the Lord. Welcome to our visitors. We're glad you're here with us and uh, just encourage you to join in the praises that we have of our God and King. It's this God that calls us to worship Him. It's His delight that we worship Him. Judges 5 is our call. When princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Regardless of what's told, we stand and we sing and we worship the Lord. I am, here I am to worship. Let's stand to sing. See the greeting of our God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. We continue our singing, uh, Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord, sing his praise. If you'd like to use the hymnal, it's number 96. We'll sing stanzas one, two, and four. Number 96. Sing to the Lord, sing his praise.
Well, as you know, this is uh, miss- Missions Month. October is Missions Month. And so we've been uh, highlighting some of the ministries that we have been involved with for many years. And tonight we get to hear from a, a ministry that we are just starting to partner with, Hungry for Christ. And so Kurt and Tracy Brower are here. Kurt, are you just coming up to speak or both? All right, come on up. And we'd love to hear a little bit. They're going to just give a brief introduction now, but they're going to be available in the narthex after the service to, um, yeah, to, to hear more about, or we can hear more about what's going on in the partnership. I know Hungry for Christ is familiar to many people here, but this is a new partnership for us, so excited. So, great. Thank you, Pastor, for having us. Uh, introduction, Kurt Brower, my wife, Tracy, and we're just here excited to share our story about how God's worked in our lives over the years um, to call us out, to, to lend our talents to the kingdom of God. So sometimes people say, well, how did Hungry for Christ start? Well, it started very humbly from a focus banquet from our church. We go to Calvary Christian Reformed Church here in Holland. And one of our focus banquets that year from our pastor was, how do you lend your talents to advance the kingdom of God? We went home that evening and prayed with our family. We have three children. And we said, how do we use our talents to advance the kingdom? We're just everyday working people. And so what we heard God say was, you know, you have talents when it comes to food and distribution and storage because that's the line of work both my wife and I were in at the time. I still am. My wife is full-time with Hungry for Christ now leading that. Uh, so we just took that, that lead from the, from the God and said, well, what, here's what we can do. And it started out of our garage where we take a few cases of food that were left over from a load that the, the, you know, the vendor rejected, and we just kind of put them in our garage and our little freezers and our little refrigerators. And... Fast forward to today, we only have three minutes here, so fast forward. Um, today we have a, a 44,000 square foot warehouse. We have a 100 foot long, 40 foot wide freezer. Um, all these things were furnished by God to help squirrel away food to give to people that need it. So, Yeah, yeah. thank you so much, um, everyone, for having us here tonight. And as Kurt said, um, the longevity of Hungry for Christ, we've been in existence now for 21 years. So starting in the garage with humble beginnings, um, you know, leading us today into this 44,000 square foot warehouse. I remember when we, you know, first walked in there, we just thought, how are we going to fill this space? There is so much space. And if any of you have an opportunity, I would love for you to come and have a tour. I will take time out to do that and show you. Um, there's not a lot of space for any food now because it's full. (laughs) So it has been a true blessing. We work with a lot of food manufacturers um, across West Michigan. Um, We work with Request Foods, Tyson Foods, Nestle Waters, Gordon Food Service, um, and a lot of that food comes in sometimes um, on a weekly basis. Sometimes it's, you know, products that a certain company, food manufacturer, is going to produce just to donate so that we can then therefore turn around and give that to those that have a need in the community um, for the holidays, so Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. Um, More after the service, we'll share um, numbers and statistics in that, but just some uh, numbers that come to my mind is um, over 3 million pounds of food every year is coming into the ministry and then exiting out of the ministry, Um, reaching out to over a couple hundred different partners throughout West Michigan, and actually we've grown beyond that as well, Um, and working with other food banks that are in other states, um, too. Uh, So we serve uh, probably now about over 175, 176,000 individuals a month, and that is through all of those partnerships that we have with all of the um, different food banks, different food ministries, food pantries, soup kitchens, churches that serve hot meals. Um, You know, different churches do that um, on Wednesday evening, so we partner with them. Um, to bless people with the food um, for their tummies. But we also want to preach and and speak God's word as well. And so we do that at the ministry. We're able to meet every morning, um, uh, Monday through Friday. We're open. Uh, We meet together with all the volunteers and staff, and we have a a moment of um, devotions. And so that lasts usually about a half an hour And it's just a great time to connect and then to share with everyone, too, what the day is going to look like. Every day is different. Um, So uh, we have lots of different programs, too, you know, at Hungry for Christ. And so after the service, we would love to be able to, you know, just share some of those different programs. And then also, um, if anybody is interested in volunteering, I know Matt um, has brought the the Cub Scouts out out to us before in the past. Um, We're... We're ready, so we would love to see your smiling faces. 
Thank you. Anything else? No, I think so. Oh, okay. Then I guess we're done. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, certainly we'll be in prayer for you. And you're going to be in the back. So after the service, go and talk with Tracy and Kurt, and we would just love to hear more about the ministry and get to know it. And Matt, this sounds like a great field trip, taking a trip down to Hungry for Christ. I'm sure we could get some folks down and um, tour, but maybe get their hands dirty a little bit too. So we good. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. You. you bet. Certainly we're going to be praying for uh, Hungry for Christ, for all the, the great mission organizations and that we've been able to partner with and the ways the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed and spread. Um, so we want to uh, do that. But also just a couple other announcements. One, um, Marlene Vanderberg is having a knee replacement tomorrow. Marlene is here. So you got you, tomorrow already. So anyway, we'll be praying for you tomorrow, certainly, and just cover her in prayer. And also Chet um, Dreyer was taken to Holland Hospital. Um, not sure exactly what's going on. Seems to be losing some blood, maybe an ulcer of some sort. But um, just pray for him as they do testing and try to figure out exactly what is happening, that they can bring some resolution to that as well. Let's come to God in prayer, though. Oh, Father in heaven, this day has been a delight. For one, just the beauty, the changing of the seasons, the beautiful sunshine, the, the delightful temperatures, and Lord, just a, a day where we can take a break from the normal rat race of life. And Lord, that you have preserved in your wisdom since the beginning of time. And Lord, modeled this day of rest for us. O oh, day of rest and gladness, we would sing. And Lord, truly we pray that this would be a day of rest, this would be a day of gladness as we worship, as we serve, and as we rest in you. So we thank you for this. We thank you for these Lord's days. We thank you that we have a place to worship, we have people to worship with, and above all that we have a God who is worthy of worship. Lord, on this day we are still just... Uh, excited and euphoric even, Lord, over the professions of faith we could witness this morning. Oh, Lord, what a blessing. And we just pray that you will continue to work among our young people and draw them to faith and beyond, that out these doors, Lord, all of those who have yet to profess the name of Jesus would come to know you. And so, Lord, in this Missions Month, we, we want to thank you for drawing our attention back here again to, to what stands at the heart of what you've called us to do, to, to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And so, Lord, we pray that that would happen. We thank you tonight for the way that that is happening through Hungry for Christ and through the work that the, the Browers were, were moved to begin years ago, and, Lord, that you are continuing and flourishing even to this day. Oh, Lord, we give you the glory and we give you the praise that through your people, Lord, you are providing for your world. You're providing for those who you have created in your image and for the people of this world. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless that ministry. And, Lord, as we uh, begin to partner together, Lord, we pray that you would use this as a way to spur us on, to serve you and, Lord, to love you and to, um, Lord, to open up doors for us to proclaim Christ and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray that this would happen, that we would, be, we would do this together faithfully. Oh, Lord, we thank you, too, for prayer, that we can come to you in our needs, in our joys, in our wants, even. And, Lord, even as we lay all of these things before your feet, Lord, you answer them in the way that is perfect, for one, but in the way that will truly glorify your name and will flourish us. And Lord, we must admit that we so often hold tightly to what we would pray, what we would desire, what our wills would have done. And Lord, we pray that you would surrender us to you, to what you would do, what you would have done, and Lord, what you would desire. For, oh Lord, we recognize even as we sing and even as we open your word and Lord, as we gather in your presence, that you are God and we are not. You are the one who is all wisdom. You are the one who is all power. You are the one who is great. So, Lord, help us to see you and even use this time of worship tonight to help us to know you more.
But Lord, in that we do pray tonight for Marlene Vanderberg as she goes for her knee replacement tomorrow. We pray, Lord, that you would remove any barriers that could come up between now and then, that the surgery could happen exactly as it needs to happen. We pray, Lord, that you would guide the hands of the doctors and the, and the nurses and all those who will be caring for her, that this will happen in a way that brings her relief and increases mobility for her and, Lord, restores fullness to her life. Oh, Lord, just bless Marlene in all of this. And even now, Lord, we pray that you would bring peace upon her heart and upon her soul as she anticipates and give her the rest tonight, knowing that she rests in you. Lord, we pray too for Chet and for Mary as uh, they're trying to figure out what is going on with Chet. And Lord, we pray that you will give the doctors insight. And as you give them insight, we pray that you would open the way for them to be able to treat him. And Lord, bring healing to his body. Oh Lord, you are faithful and you are good. And we can submit ourselves to you, and Lord, we lay all of these things at your feet, knowing that you are good, that you are gracious, that you're the God, you're the only God to which we can turn. But Lord, you're the God who delights to give good gifts to your children. So we pray that you would give us the gifts that you delight to give to your children. And the greatest of those gifts is certainly faith. So tonight, Lord, we pray that you would give faith to us that you would grow our faith, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would shore it up where it is merely smoldering and, Lord, and weak. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us tonight. So speak to us in your word and open it before us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, Judges 4, we are... I'll open your Bibles there first of all before I kind of explain this a bit. But um, Judges 4, it's page uh, 239. Now, um, for our guests, we've been working our way through Hebrews 11. If you're familiar with Hebrews 11, you know it to be the hall of faith. So it's a, a list of all of these heroes of the faith. At least that's a, a name that's often given to them. And we have uh, been working on these for the last several months. And there are several that have explanations that tell us why it is that they are considered heroes of the faith. But as uh, Pastor Kevin began last week, um, we're at the point now where we are toward the end of the chapter, but there is a whole list of others that, um, that, that, he, he, that the author of Hebrews wants to list. And he says, what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, which we looked at last week, Barak and Samson, Samson and Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets. Now, we're not going to cover all the prophets there, but um, you, you, you see the story here. The, one after another, all of those who God, by faith, used for his kingdom and used for his glory. Well, tonight we're going to go back to Judges 4, and we're going to look at Barak. And, and Barak is one of those Old Testament characters that's not all that familiar, especially compared to a Samson or a Gideon. But Barak, um, back in the book of Judges, um, is another example here, and this story is another example of what we call the Judges cycle. Pastor Kevin mentioned this last week, but the cycle goes over and over and over again. You know, Israel, the people of God, sin against God. They fall away from him. So God sends an enemy to conquer them, and they're defeated. And in their defeat, they cry out to God for mercy. And, and of course, God hears, and God sends a deliverer. He sends a judge and rescues the people, and they are restored again before God. And the cycle repeats again and again and again and again throughout the book. And so we enter that pattern again, again tonight in Judges 4 with, with Barak. Now, to, to mention Barak, who is the one that's mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, is to forget about the two women that really overshadow him in this account, Deborah and Jael. But we'll hear about them as we look at the Word of God together. So people of God, hear the very Word of our God. And the people of Israel did, again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. 
Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, and Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and of the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zananim, which is near Kadesh. When Sisera, who told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Hagasheth Hagoyim up to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harosheth Hagayim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg. And took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground, while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin king of Canaan. So far, the reading of God's word. You may want to just keep that open and set it to the side. We're going to read chapter 5 um, after we sing this uh, next hymn, Who is on the Lord's Side? So let's stand to sing Who is on the Lord's Side, verses 1, 3, and 4.
You know, Pastor Kevin and I were talking about these uh, passages in Judges. You know, last week he preached on Gideon, we're preaching on uh, Barak today. Uh, we said we remembered a lot of these Old Testament accounts by how we heard them in Sunday school, right? You know, Gideon, you know about the fleece, and you know about maybe the soldiers drinking the water from the brook, but um, there's a whole lot more detail that we cover when we get to the actual passage. And, and this is one, I mean, uh, I'll tell you, when I read Judges 4, the one image that's etched in my mind is of Jael and that tent peg. And I get the heebie-jeebies every time I read that story. I'm guessing many of you do as well, too. Now, the, the, the Sunday school versions of these stories, I mean, they are the ones that kind of settle it into our minds. But now as we go back to them, maybe a little more grown up, right? We look at these stories and we look at these accounts in the Old Testament and we see the multi-layered uh, intent that God has in inspiring them in his word. And, and we're seeing even here that God uses just very ordinary people like you and me. And, and, and what makes these people heroes or makes anyone a hero is, is not some greatness or uniqueness that we find deep down. But what makes these men and these women here heroes and heroines is the God who works in them. In fact, God is working in these three, Deborah, Barak, and Jael, as instruments of faith. Now, we, we read the historical account here in Judges 4. Um, Judges 5 is the poetic account. So we get, to, we get the story twice. Now, I know this is a fairly long passage, but it's, it, it's good for us. It's good for us to read Scripture together. And uh, let's read chapter 5 as we hear what happened here and get a little behind-the-scenes picture. Hear the Word of God. Then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Abinoam on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region to, of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, yet the clouds dropped water. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. The travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on the white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way. To the sound of musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then down marched the remnants of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against, against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Machir marched down the commanders, and from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah, and Issachar faithful to Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels among the clans of Reuben. There were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds, to hear the whistling of the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed behind the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his lands. Zebulun is a, is a people who risked their lives to death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought. They fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh. At the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with a galloping, galloping of his steeds. 
Curse Meraz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women, of women BJL, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of, twent, of tent-dwelling women, most blessed. He asked for milk, and she gave. Him, or she asked, he asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg, and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet he sank. He fell. He, where he sank, there he fell dead. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera, wailing through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princesses answer, indeed she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb of two for every man. Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera. Spoil of dyed materials embroidered. embroidered. Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Let's pray. O Lord, this word that you bring to us, you inspired it long ago, O Lord, inspire it in us tonight. May your spirit work within us that we would know what you speak to your people. Reveal yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we all love underdog stories. You know, the little kid that topples the bully on the playground, you love to hear that. Or the kind of the doofy, dorky guy that gets the girl. Those are all kind of the mainstays of movies, right? The plot lines that we love, you kind of cheer them on, and it's great. But when it happens in real life, I'll tell you, it's truly inspiring. Now, in Judges 4 here, we're introduced to three underdogs, and really three of the most unlikely heroes that you would find in the whole book of Judges. You know, we expect supers, like Samson, which Pastor Sopat is going to bring to us next week, Sunday evening, or the confident warriors like Jephthah. Two weeks from now, we'll get back to Jephthah. But those are the kind of heroes that we expect. But here we've got three, Deborah, Jael and Barak. None of them would have really been written into the script of history except for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in Judges 4. But they're not here because they pulled themselves up and overcame odds by some surprising burst of courage or skill or strength. They're here because we see God in action. Now that takes us back to another passage that Pastor Kevin brought out last week, Sunday evening. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, where it says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He ch- God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Well, in this story here, Barak, the one who is brought into the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, when we're looking at him and these women that were used with him, we're staring into the face of of the foolishness of God. God's foolish way that he wins. Well, since Barak is nothing without Deborah and Jael, we're going to look at all three of them sort of individually tonight. So I just want to kind of work through those three. And we're going to start with with Deborah. And and we don't have to dig very far to see why she is unique. I mean, first of all, she's a woman, right? Called by God to speak God's word to the people. That was rare. Now, it could have been that the priests were failing to do their job, which was a common story throughout, throughout Judges. So, so he raised up a woman as a judgment call upon them. Or, or simply God could be doing a different thing here. He simply could be taking a different route. But Deborah is the only female judge that we find in the whole book of Judges. 
So she doesn't fit the mold. Now, the second uniqueness about Deborah is that she's not a warrior. All the other judges were. They, they, they all were warriors. I mean, we looked at Gideon. Even though he's cowardly, he was still a warrior. He was still a soldier. And, and really all the others as well, too. But, but not Deborah. Deborah wasn't a warrior. She was simply a judge. And, and so she led the people out of her wisdom and her character rather than out of sheer might. You know, while others were, were making battle plans... Deborah was here guiding and counseling the people. Now, all throughout the Old Testament, and this is kind of what I want you to catch as we're going through these three individuals, all throughout the Old Testament, God is setting up and he's helping us understand what kind of ruler he desires for his people, what kind of ruler he's going to set over top of his people. Now, there's no one person in the whole of the Old Testament that, that fits that bill fully. There's not a single one, some better than others. But they all tell us something about the one that God was going to send for his people. And, and so here in Deborah, we see that God's chosen leader doesn't just rescue, but he also rules. God is going to bring a leader to his people that rules that governs, that leads, that counsels with wisdom. In Isaiah 9, we, we see that God's chosen one was going to be a wonderful counselor, a counselor, prince of peace, establishing and upholding his kingdom with justice and righteousness. So as we look at Deborah, that's, that, that's the first thing that we see. God is going to bring a ruler like Deborah, who rules with wisdom and, with, and, and out of wisdom and out of her character. All right, the next unlikely hero, Barak. Now, we don't know much about this guy. Doesn't tell us anything more in Hebrews 11. But uh, we do know that he is from Kadesh, which is in Naphtali. That's in the northern part of Israel. So if you just think about up in the north. Now, that's not insignificant because that is the area of Israel that had come, come to suffer under this enemy king, Jabin, and his cruel general, Sisera. So that was right there, right in the middle of the people. And so, so Barak is a native of that territory. And being a native, he could muster up an army. He, he, he knew the people. He knew which people to, to inspire and to kind of get them behind him. But what makes Barak unlikely are the circumstances. I mean, for one thing, just think about Sisera's army here. I mean, an army that was standing for one thing, that was well-trained, well-equipped. I mean, it says they're operating 900 chariots. And when we come to the story, Barak doesn't even have an army yet. I mean, he doesn't have anybody. They haven't been training. So when you think about these numbers, you got 900 chariots, you got 10,000 men of, of, of Barak. I mean, this would have been like 10,000 pitchforks going against 900 tanks. So, so, so that's kind of, those are the odds that, that we're looking at here. So, so that makes him a very unlikely leader in a battle. Now, the other thing that seems unlikely about Barak is that he also seems to be fearful. If you look at verse 8, if you've got your Bibles open, he refuses to go into battle unless Deborah is going with him. Now, in a pessimistic way, I want to say this, well, he doesn't dare going without Deborah holding his hand, right? That's not how we should look at this, really. I mean, I think we could be more optimistic about this because De Barak knew his odds. He knew his odds. Um, he, he wasn't stupid. He, he uh, humanly speaking, he, he knew that he was never going to be able to last against these 900 chariots, well-trained, well-equipped. And, and on top of that, he also knew Deborah and her, rep rep her reputation. She was the one who had been set up as judge over Israel. She was the one who represented God. She's the one who spoke God's word. So if, if Barak was going to win this battle... 
He needed God's word guiding him. He needed God with him at every turn because it sure didn't look like he was going to be able to do it on his own. So Deborah is asked. And by asking Deborah, it's, it's, it's really, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to Barak here because it seems more to be a testimony of his faith. He knows what he needs. And he goes in the strength of the Lord. So we shouldn't look at verse 9 where uh, Deborah responds to him as a rebuke against Barak's faith. It's simply a prophecy of what's going to happen. God gives faith. God gives faith. But he's going to continue this pattern that he uses again and again. That we talked about from 1 Corinthians 1. Where, where he uses the foolish and the weak things in the, in the world's eyes. Where he's not going to use the pattern of human strength like what we often turn to so quickly to win the battle. No, he, he, he's got his way. And God is going to win this battle. And he's going to prove to his people that he is the one who moves on behalf of his own. So with all of this, with the bad odds, with knowing, as it says here, that, that Barak, even if he wins the battle, he's not going to receive the honor. The honor is going to go to a woman. And that day that would have been unthinkable for, for a guy like Barak. But, but even with all of that, Barak listens to God and obediently charges ahead. This is remarkable, friends. I mean, he, 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 even with all of that going against him, he goes and listens to God. That's how true faith operates. In this, in this humility, it's not self-seeking. It's listening to God every step of the way. That's how true faith operates. And, and, and again, just like we saw with Deborah, Barak again points us to the type of leader that God was going to raise up for his people. One, as we know of in, in Philippians 2, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's Barak. Now, before we get to JL, we need to fill in some of what happened here. Because back at the beginning of this chapter, we see, again, that judge's cycle repeating over again. So the previous judge, Ehud, had died. And Israel fell back into doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord sold them into hand, the hands of the enemy. And this time it was Jabin, the Canaanite king. And it says in verse 3 here, that Jabin, at the hands of his general Sisera, had cruelly oppressed the people for 20 years. 20 years. And it caused them to cry out to the Lord, help us, Lord, help us. I mean, they, they knew they were in trouble. And, and every time God's people cry out to him, whether they deserve it or not, and really the answer is not, right? Not just them, but us as well, too. But God hears. Whenever God's people cry out to him, he hears. That's something, friend, we always have to remember, right? No matter where we are. I mean, God, when we cry out to God, he hears. And in his mercy, he responds to the cries of his people, even though we don't deserve it at all. So, so through Deborah and Barak, God responds. And he raises up an army. Now, did you, I mentioned it earlier, but did you catch how many men God raised up? I'm looking around. I think there's only one of our kids who was here Wednesday night. It was Harper. Harper, do you remember how many men he raised up? Tell your dad to tell me. 10,000, right? That's a whole lot of men that he raised up. So on, on Wednesday nights, we have a candy question, right? and their candy quiz, whatever, and the kids get to answer the question. It was, how many men did, did uh, Deborah and Barak raise up? And it was 10,000 of them. But, but this 10,000, as I said earlier, is this ragtag team of untrained men going against the well-oiled machine of, of Sisera's military. And what happens? I mean, we'd expect Sisera to crush this peasant uprising. But look at the end of verse 16. 
It says there that all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Now, if, if we would just start there, we would, we would miss the whole point of the story. Because go back up to verse 14. Who secured this victory? Before one sword was drawn, Deborah already had prophesied. She had said, up, for this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? Again, it doesn't say God will give you the victory. It doesn't say it's going to be something that he's going to do. Just get out there and do the best you can, and, and, but, but God's going to get it done. No, God has already given you the victory. Past tense. This is, this is the point here. Past tense. It's as sure as done. Teens, this is why you need to know your grammar, right? You have to learn grammar because past tense matters. It, it's something, it's as good as done when the Lord promises it. And, and, and verse 15 wants to make sure we don't miss what he's doing here. It said that the Lord routed Sisera. So the Lord did this and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. God won the victory. And in his divine plan, he raises up one more unlikely hero. And he raises this other hero up as well, for one thing, to show us himself, to show us the rescuer that he would bring, but also to prove that it is all God's victory. It is up to God to win. Now, already back in verse 11, I don't know if you noticed this as we were reading through it, but it seems like there's sort of this interruption in the storyline. We're introduced to this guy, Heber the Kenite. Yeah, who? Why in the world does Heber the Kenite come into the story? Who is he and why in the world does he even matter? Well, he really doesn't really come in to the story because it's not him that matters. It's his wife. And she comes in after the battle is over. Well, the, the most of the battle is over. Now, you see, Heber had come to settle in Jabin's land for some reason, Jabin being the king of Canaan. So, so he comes and he, he, he lives with Jabin. And so Jabin and Heber make some sort of special deal together, and um, Heber gets to stay. So Sisera, the general of Jabin, sees Heber and says, you know what, this guy owes me. Or at least he owes my king a favor. And fleeing from the defeat of this battle, Sisera thinks this is a good time to cash in that favor. So this is where, we're, this is where we get to see the, this third unlikely hero, Jael. You see, back on the battlefield, Sisera is the only one left. Everyone else is destroyed. All, of, all the other 900 chariots, 899, Sisera's left. And, and so what he does, seeing that he's defeated, he jumps out of his chariot and takes off on foot. And he runs into Heber's camp, and it says he runs to the tent of Jael. Now this is a fascinating story. If there is something that could make a movie, it's this. Because with treachery and intrigue, Jael welcomes him into her tent and, and reassures him. She gives him some warm milk to make him nice and sleepy and covers him up with a, with a blanket and provides a nice place for him to fall asleep. And certainly this guy is exhausted from the battle and fleeing from the, the enemy. And then wham. It says in verse 21, Jael took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Now, I have to admit, this is an image that comes to my mind. I mean, this must have been scarring for me as a Sunday school kid, but every time I go camping and I take a tent peg and put it in and set up a tent, I mean, this always comes to my mind. and Just shudder a little bit. But, but you know, back in that day, setting up the tents was, was women's work. That's what the women did, right? They set up the tents. They set up the home. And, and so she would have been very comfortable with, the, with these tools. And she, so she would have used them with ease. And So then it says, she went softly to him. Seems a bit ironic, but she didn't want to wake him, right? 
And she drove the peg into his temple until it went down to the ground. Right through his temple. And then as if we needed these next words at all, because we know what happened, right? It says, so he died. So the significance of this is not the gruesome nature of of the account, but it's the fact that what Deborah prophesied back already in verse 9 comes true right here. You know, in fact, this, this whole gruesome event here, it points back even further in Scripture, all the way to Genesis 3, where we get the prophecy of God himself, where he said, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Now, now Jael didn't fulfill that promise, not, not at all. But at an interlude here, she, she points again to God's perfect rescuer, the one who would drive home that victory completely. Did you, did you notice how many of the enemies of Israel were perished? Every single one of them. And, and, and even the way it's described here, there is no doubt that this, that this was a complete and absolute victory. But the one that God would bring would also be a complete victory. There would be no doubt whatsoever that he has crushed the enemy. And that the sworn enemy, our devil, but the one that God was going to send would do exactly that. And, and so all throughout this whole story, God's showing us through Deborah and Barak and Jael, that the, he, he's showing us a picture of this rescuer, the one that he was preparing to send into the world. Now, humanly speaking, the honor of this victory is is given to Jael. We see a little bit of that in in chapter 5. But the real honor, as we can plainly see, goes to no human at all. Because it was the Lord who spoke to and through Deborah. It was his word that she brought. Deborah is just the instrument. It was the Lord who went ahead of Barak. He's the one that gave the victory in battle. It was the Lord who orchestrated all of this to hand Sisera over to Jael. It's God who is the rescuer of his people. And and he uses all of these baffling circumstances that we see in life, the crazy situations that that we find ourselves in, the unlikely heroes. He uses the weak people to accomplish his work. That's how God has always worked, and that's how God is still working today. Whether we realize it or not, whether we see him in action or not, God is at work. He's the one that's doing this. He's the one that's securing the battle. Now, now one of the beautiful pictures, or the the, the features of this uh, account, is that we don't just get one version, but we get two versions. I mentioned this earlier. Chapter 4 is the historical play-by-play. But then Judges 5 peels back the curtain a bit further so that we can see a bit more of what's going on behind the scenes. Because there's always more going on than what we can simply see in life. You have the events that unfold throughout our days, throughout the course of history, right? But we know there's a back, there's there's, there's a behind the scenes going on. And that's what Judges 5 is is looking at. So we looked at the perspective of the historian, but let's just take a couple minutes here to look look from the perspective of the poet. Now, in in chapter 4, the Lord is only named in four verses. And three of those are by Deborah. But if you just kind of glance through Judges 5 with me, you glance through there and you see that God is everywhere. He's the reason to be praised for every victory here. Now, what's the lesson for God's people? God is everywhere. Whether we see him or not, God's there. God's at work. Whether we notice him or or, or not, God's the one who is leading and directing and and winning and, and, and securing the battle for us. He is there sovereignly working out his good will and his perfect will, and he always comes out victorious. Whether we notice it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, God is at work in the world and in our lives. Now, but by inspiring both 
Judges 4 and Judges 5, we're, we're being challenged to have these two perspectives in our lives. A Judges 4 perspective and a, a Judges 5 perspective. Judges 4. We live in history, right? We live in minutes and hours and our days, they all kind of tack one on the other. We march out into battle, take the hammer into our hand, whatever it means right there. By faith, we face the enemy every single day. But we also need to see a Judges 5 perspective, that God's hand is at work behind everything. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, we can and should live our lives and order our memories not only historically, but theologically. Not simply recollecting what happened or what we did, but searching out what God was doing. So not just thinking historically, but also thinking theologically about our lives, thinking biblically about our lives. And then he gives the reason here. He says, this keeps us from over-honoring ourselves and success or despairing in our struggles. Because part of the key to enjoying peace is to be continually praising the Lord for what he has done and is doing for us. Because the story we tell of our lives is not so much about us as it is about him. Well, why is that? Why is the story not so much about us and about him? Well, because God has already won the victory. He's already won the victory through the rescuer that Deborah, Barak, and Jael point us to, which is his son, Jesus Christ. I mean, there is nothing weaker or more foolish to the world than Jesus. I mean, his birth through his life to his death on a cross especially. There is nothing weaker than a dying Savior. But through Christ... God has defeated our greatest enemies. Not will defeat, has defeated our greatest enemies. Sin, death, the devil, the temptations of the world. And he hasn't just proven that he can, but he, he's proven that he desires to give us the victory. So the challenge that's coming here to us from, from Judges 4 and 5 is to cling to the God who wins. We may not see it, we may not notice it, but he's always with his people. Amen. Oh, Father, we thank you that we serve a God who wins, who is powerfully at work in the world, whether we see it or not. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you are at work, even right now, in what may seem foolish to us, but Lord, you are carrying out your good purposes in the hearts and the lives of your people. So, Lord, move within us. In Jesus' name, amen. The deacons are going to take the offering, which this evening is for Audio Scripture Ministries, another organization that we've partnered with a long time, um, but getting the word out to the world. And we've all heard Pastor Lloyd uh, speak about Audio Scripture Ministries and the excitement that he has for bringing the Word of God to people who, who can't read or who don't have access. So as the deacons take the offering, please also sign and pass the fellowship pads.
As you depart, don't forget to uh, take a moment to stop and hear more about Hungry for Christ. And um, we're going to close with a song, O Worship the King. We'll stand to sing the first four verses, and then the last verse we'll use it as, as our doxology. Let's rise. the blessing of our God. Grace and mercy and peace of God be with you all and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.